You may notice I've gone blonde. That's because I've gone blonde. Brandfield. Just to be clear, the game here did not literally cause people to die. The developers did not die. The people working at the publisher did not die. But there were definite deaths in the business sense. Fast forward in reverse to 2005. The next two consoles have been announced. Microsoft's second, Sony's third. Resident Evil 4 and the first God of War had released and raised the bar for all games. The Halo series was still the hottest of hot stuff as we eagerly awaited the chance to finish the fight in Halo 3. Two years later, at least. It was a time of growth and expansion for video games, and being before the days of the indie explosion, it was still pretty normal for newcomers to try the hand at making something big and special that could compete on the main stage, that could become the next big thing. Advent Rising exploded out of the hype gates. Billed as a contender to Halo's throne from the outset, Bungie's inspiration on this sci-fi action adventure was immediately apparent, and it wasn't a comparison the developer Glyphex or the publisher Majesco shied away from. If you're new, small, and say that you're trying to be the next big thing, and people compare you to the current big thing favourably, why would you try and nudge them off this particular scent? No, Advent Rising would lean into this Halo killer hype, presenting itself from its reveal as an intelligent blockbuster with deep narrative, fantastical sci-fi locations and characters, and incredible ambition. It would, after all, be a trilogy, Glyphex said. One official URL for the game was adventtrilogy.com. It wasn't just a vague, maybe we'll make three claim. The story had been planned well in advance, having come from the game's director Donald Mustard and his brother back in their own high school days. It was meant to be a film, then a comic book, but now it would be a game. An epic, bar-raising game of three parts. You would go gallivanting around the galaxy, explore in a host of vehicles, meet and converse with all manner of life forms, make decisions that mattered and ones which would impact the game's outcome, and follow on into Advent Rising parts two and three. If Advent Rising sounds a bit like Mass Effect, that's just because Advent Rising sounds a bit like Mass Effect years before Mass Effect released. One thing Bioware's spacefaring epic didn't have, mind you, was a PSP spin-off, a prequel to help set up the backstory of Advent Rising's main characters. Advent Shadow, as the spin-off would be known, was just one part of the ways in which the whole Advent Rising universe would come to be. There'd be a comic book series and novels from co-author of the game's dialogue, Orson Scott Card, himself a noted sci-fi author as well as homophobe, but let's not get bogged down in that particular morass. All these big plans, all this ambition was coming from Glyph X, a studio that had zero developed games to its name. This was an art studio which had involvement in creating cover art for games, banners, adverts, magazine art, sometimes in-game cinematics like for Soldier of Fortune 2, but not the games themselves. Donald Mustard pushed his two compatriots at the company to open themselves up to making a game though, and the lack of experience on show was more than made up for with the wild ambition. Glyphex went from a few people making art to a studio of around 15 who worked for 28 months putting together Advent Rising. These ambitious development plans were gleefully backed by some aggressive grandstanding marketing from publisher Majesco. Advent Rising was advertised in cinemas, appearing to punters before films as massive as Star Wars Revenge of the Sith, something you really didn't see much of in 2005. Then, not content with grabbing attention by claiming Advent Rising was Halo done better and putting ads in front of everyone in the world, the publisher also put together an eye-catching promotion for the game, a contest. A contest open to anyone who picked up one of the first 500,000 copies of Advent Rising on Xbox, in which the winner would bag a straightforward, no-nonsense, one million dollars. Given we live now, in a world of hindsight, it can be hard to fathom for those who didn't experience it just how ever-present Advent Rising was. It was hyped. It had money spent on pushing it under the nose of anyone even vaguely paying attention. It was making big promises and the right noises. It was aiming to take games up another notch, to make them even more cinematic, to bring us an entire universe of wonder to get lost in, and the promise of a trilogy to spread it all out through. Advent Rising was set up to be a gigantic success. Advent Rising was not a gigantic success. It was hardly even a small success. Remember those 500,000 competition entries available? The game only sold around 130,000 copies at retail. After launching May 31st, 2005 on Xbox and PC a few weeks later, 370,000 entries remained unclaimed, it seemed. And Halo, well, remained entirely unkilled. What went wrong 
Was Advent Rising the worst of the worst? Hardly. It wasn't great, of course. It was very obviously rushed to market. The plentiful cut content found later down the line in the game's files would be testament to this. And the fact it was riddled with irritating bugs and issues in the Xbox release didn't really see it put its best foot forward at launch. It wasn't the easiest thing in the world to patch games on console at that point, so what you got was what you got. As such, the complaints by reviewers of glitches and crashes translated to exactly that in the home. But the PC version largely fixed these problems and resulted in a relatively stable game telling a vaguely interesting story and offering up some fun in a Halo meets PsyOps sort of way. It introduced a genuinely good flick targeting system. It had no real loading times once you were into things. It even let you pause, skip, and restart cutscenes, the latter of those three options being one you don't even see these days. It was by no means a classic, and even fixing many of the problems for the PC version didn't stop it from being a rush job. But at the same time, Advent Rising wasn't a skid mark on the underpants of gaming. It wasn't an Aliens Colonial Marines or a WWE 2K20. All the same, Advent Rising was, after what was promised, a complete failure. And so the fallout began. Three months after the game released, Majesco announced the cancellation of the Million Dollar Contest, citing no technically feasible solution that would allow the contest to continue in a fair and secure manner. In other words, hardly anyone had legitimately entered the competition, so it wouldn't be fair to run it as it was. It could also have had a little to do with the publisher having a tough time of things financially and not wanting to just have to give away a cool million bucks to reward one of the very few people who bought its big hope for the mainstream gaming market, or even to reward someone who hadn't bought it and had just hacked an entry to the competition. Could have been. Probably. <laughs> who knows? Either way, instead of a million dollars, anyone who'd entered the competition was offered instead two games from Majesco's back catalogue, including the likes of Blood Rain 2, Guilty Gear X2 Reload, Psychonauts, Razor's Hell, and Phantom Dust. Some good games, all things considered, though not really the same as a million dollars, it's fair to say. A couple of the promised cross-media tie-ins did come to fruition, with a comic book accompanying Advent Rising at launch and a five-issue run called Advent Rising Rock the Planet, releasing later in 2005. The tie-in novels, to be written by noted sci-fi author slash homophobe Orson Scott Card, however, were cancelled, as was the PSP spin-off. Through all of this, Halo did remain unkilled. Things snowballed. This wouldn't be the last game Glyph X worked on in any sort of development capacity, with Glyph X credited as part of the animation team working on PS2's ATV Off-Road Fury 4. But after that came a largely unsurprising silence. Glyphex had underperformed and left many unimpressed. The studio's inexperience and a lack of support from elsewhere combining to entirely derail the company's game development ambitions. The planned trilogy would soon stop being mentioned, and hardly be remembered, leaving, in the concrete sense, nothing more than a middling game and a cliffhanger ending to frustrate the few who did genuinely like Advent Rising. The developer continued to operate, quietly, until it was acquired by animation-focused creative company Sandman Studios in September of 2006. It had been a bold opening gambit for Glyphex, but the pressures of making a game with the eyes of the world on it, and the pressures of making a game under the watch of a publisher itself under intense pressure, had proven too much. The Halo killer hadn't even made a dint on anything other than Glyphex and Majesco's fortunes, and rather than carving itself a niche in the contemporary gaming pantheon, it had fizzled out as a complete non-starter, taking its developer with it. And it didn't stop with the dev. Majesco had seen poor financial results owing to recent releases just not living up to expectations. Blood Rain was a hit, but its sequel had floundered. Guilty Gear wasn't quite there because the fighting renaissance hadn't struck yet and Psychonauts had failed worse than Advent Rising, apparently because people are dumb. The high-profile failure of Advent Rising just cemented the publisher's status as a purveyor of serial misadventures. The writing was on the wall, floor, ceiling, someone probably even took to skywriting it. Even with Advent Rising's budget coming in at a surprisingly modest $4 million, less than a third of what it cost to make 2005 releases like Call of Duty 2 and Quake 4, the damage had been done. In January 2006, president of Majesco Jesse Sutton announced the publisher would be stepping away from the world of premium video games, instead focusing on budget titles, or value in Sutton's words, and handheld games. Speaking on an earnings call, Sutton said, 
As a result of the general weakness in the video game sector along with the rising costs of development and marketing next generation games, we have concluded that Majesco's current resources do not allow us to effectively compete in the big budget console game marketplace. This move, as well as those prior failures in the big leagues of video game releases, saw shareholders sue Majesco citing mismanagement, claims which were eventually settled out of court. Halo stood tall, definitely not killed, but there was a body count when the Dust Advent Rising kicked up had settled. Glyphex continued in some form, absorbed into the wider sphere at Sandman Studios and so largely anonymous in its activities. None of it involved making video games though. Majesco's journey through casual and handheld gaming saw success with the likes of Cooking Mama, then meandering nothingness, leaving the industry after being bought out by a biotechnology firm, returning again, and generally not doing well. Safe to say if Advent Rising had performed how it was hoped or expected to, both the developer and publisher would be in very different positions today. It would also likely mean we wouldn't have seen a copy of Advent Rising being bundled in for free with every DVD of Seed, Uwe Boll's joyful jaunt through ultraviolence and terrible filmmaking. I have no idea how or why that tie-in came about, but when they're using you as an enticement to purchase anything made by Uwe Boll, you know you're not doing well. Of course, Advent Rising's main creative force, Donald Mustard, ended up on his arse, destitute and alone, with no potential redemption in his future after the abject failure of the game he put so much heart and effort into. I'm lying, he's the worldwide creative director at Epic Games. Fair play, Don, there were good ideas in the game, it was just executed poorly and proved to be the albatross around everyone's neck. The industry changed significantly not long after Advent Rising's release, with the opening up of the digital floodgates allowing for indie games to take hold, for smaller titles to be viable in the market, for this move to games as a service and whatever else we have going on nowadays. In that respect, Advent Rising is very much a time capsule, a moment in time. Not just the game, but everything around it. The marketing, the apparent desire to dethrone Halo, the scope of what was essentially a big indie release. It hadn't happened much much before 2005, and it wouldn't happen much after. It was the sort of game that realistically shouldn't have received all the attention it did, and nobody would have been surprised to see it ignored as with a million others of the era, the pariahs and time shifts and brute forces of the world. So now, with modern eyes looking back, it hardly seems surprising at all that Advent Rising killed its developer, its publisher, and never became the trilogy it always promised to be. And yet, while Glyphex is out of the picture and Majesco is still alive, I think? Recent news has shown that some 14 years later, well, 14 years plus however long it takes to actually sort out, we could well be getting those long-promised Advent Rising sequels. In June 2020, Ziggurat Interactive purchased the rights to Majesco Properties' Blood Rain, Razor's Hell, Flip's Twisted World, and, yep, Advent Rising. While at the time of talking, the indie-focused studio is concentrating on Blood Rain, the fact Advent Rising has a new owner, and one willing to actually do something with it, could mean there's yet a future for the game that laid waste to the companies involved in its creation. So, just be careful, eh? Bye!